three amazing guests. We're going to start out with a bang this morning. Uh, how many of you have watched Doctor Who for more than 20 years? All right. Well, that is wonderful. Uh, you, know, you were not 20, so I don't know why you raised your hand. That was very strange. <laughs> but anyway, well, I'll tell you, I too have been a fan. Yes. I too have been a fan since I was a wee little boy in the 80s. Well, 70s, whatever. Anyway, back in the day. And I got to tell you that I'm very excited to have the best seat in the house and to have some amazing guests. Now, we know that there is classic Who and new Who, but it's all Who to me. And in the next hour, we have both old Who and new Who, or classic Who, whatever you want to call it. So, shall we get started? Yes! Yeah. Yeah. All right, this child right here is not sure. It's okay, we're going to get started anyway. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, then let's bring out our amazing guests. Let's start out with a man who has actually founded his own political party. He actually served as a captain in the Queen Victoria's Rifles. We know him best as Captain Mike Gates. Please welcome to the stage Richard Franklin, ladies and gentlemen. So, if only half of you have heard their story. So, there you go. <laughs> yes, I know. 
I know. In fact, uh, let's go ahead and, and talk a little bit about what you have done in the last year or so, because I know you've all been very busy. And so, what? Well, <laughs> as, an agent, <laughs> as an agent, you have been booking people. I have been seeing the people you represent places, so it's important. Oh, yeah. no, well, yeah. <laughs> no, no. Um, I, I haven't been an agent for 10 years. No, no, no. for the last year. You haven't been an agent for 10 years. I haven't done anything for 10 years. <laughs> what you, so what did you do for the last 10 years? I'm retired. Oh, so he's retired with a sheep, uh, an acre full of sheep. <laughs> I'm walking my dog, that's what I've been doing. I'm coming to Doctor Who convention. Yes. <laughs> and, and I do the odd big finish. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's something that, uh, that we've all been enjoying because it's been allow allowing your character to actually blossom. So you have been doing the big finish. Yeah, I have been doing the big finish, which is a joy. And I don't know whether any of you have heard them, but I have to say, even though he's sitting beside me on the right, when I'm in the booth recording a big finish and Fraser is doing Patrick as the doctor, he is absolutely amazing. Um, he, he actually, I can see him out of the corner of my eye, and he actually physically becomes the doctor. Um, when he's playing Pat, he, 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 he's absolutely brilliant. I hate saying this as well, <laughs> as well. <laughs> I mean, but it is the truth. Yeah. yeah. And, and how does that affect you in the booth when you're, when you're recording? It makes an, a massive difference mm -hmm. because not only does he do Jamie, obviously, very well, <laughs> um, but to do to do Pat so well as well mm -hmm. um, makes my life so much easier. But really. your, your voice goes up. When I know. I get so it's really good. I get all squeaky. And I don't know how I do that because clearly over the years I've, I've got a deeper voice than I had when I was in the um, some, Something happens and uh, when you just read, uh, something happens. So. Did that character just blossom? Yeah. Well, and it's lovely to some of the stories with Zoe being an older woman as well, and, and I'm trying to remember that. what it is she's forgotten. And how has that gone as far as the character? I don't mean to just you, know, yeah, but, but, but yeah, that's, that's a fascinating thing. We'll talk about Zoe a little bit more, because uh, where she's going in the uh, audio and such like that. So now, you have been a very busy man your entire life, but you recently, uh, well, how, how long ago did you found the, uh, what, what's the name of the political party? Well, the, 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 uh, the last election, I found it a party where I didn't stand as the candidate. Right. Um, it was called 3050. Mm -hmm. It was uh, linking the um, enthusiasm of the under 30s mm -hmm. with the life experience <laughs> of the over 50s. Sounds <laughs> <laughs> like he was kind of feeling the burn. I don't know. <laughs> and um, we got 78 votes. But, uh, <laughs> But the point, the point was, it was, it was a sort of mission impossible. Right. Um, it really, it's more satisfaction to me to be able to get some uh, radical ideas out. Right, because... Uh, it was a very, very strong uh, Labour constituency of Bethel, Green and Bow. Any of you, any of you been to London? Yeah. It's, it's in the East End and it has um, a lot of problems. But it's very, very left-wing. So we, we never uh, had a chance. Right. We didn't do it for the chance, we did it because we wanted to get the ideas out there. That's where you start, you plant the seeds and then let them grow. <laughs> Which I think that's fantastic. But, but, uh, and what else have you been doing lately? Uh, I've been writing mm -hmm. quite a bit, actually. Um, I wrote a play from family documents uh, about the First World War, uh, which, um, okay, a little bit of boasting coming here, but it was selected out of over 90 scripts for a, a festival, a RADA festival in London, which has uh, got quite a, um, a good reputation, shall we say. And uh, that is going to be performed at the end of June. Well, congratulations. But, and also there's other bits of writing I've been doing as well. Well, you, you've written several plays throughout your life. Uh, yes, I have, yes. One was called Shakespeare as a Hunchback. <laughs> yeah. was, uh, that's in defense of Richard III. And um, I wrote another rather scurrilous play for the Brighton Festival called um, 
uh, Shakespeare by Shackers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and everybody got the wrong idea. I thought, yeah. <laughs> Well, I believe you. I believe you. But the, the, the audience showed up completely shocked. Yeah, I know. It was disgusting. <laughs> Just like the English audience, revolting. Revolting. <laughs> the peasants are. Revolting. I thought it was. What's your name? Oh, Peter. Uh, Peters. What is he? Oh, I can't do it with that one. Oh, but, uh, <laughs> it, it could be. I mean, um, I can't remember what your name is actually. Don't be so stupid. We call her Wendy. But she might be Pathers, you see. I thought that was, I thought I was called Frankers at school. Oh, Pathers is my nickname. No, everybody calls me Pathers. Well, there you are. And I call Shakespeare Shaggers, and the agents wouldn't speak to me. It's a little bit of our clients going for a dirty thing like that. Well, you know what's kind of like when you go chug, chug, my mug? You just can't finish it. I understand. <laughs> wow. Oh, man. It's okay, we're in Texas. <laughs> I'm, I'm not from here either. True. And what have you been up to the last year? Because you were in a play up until August. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was, it was, um, has anybody heard of Agatha Christie? Woo! Yeah, yeah. Woo! And it's a play called And Then There Were None. Mm -hmm. Ah, right. It, it's yes. about a, a, an island just off of Portsmouth. And I'm, I was Rogers the book. And these ten strangers, or nine strangers, get invited to a party by a strange man. And once they're all sat down and having cocktails, this, I put the record on, and this voice says, Lord so-and-so, you, you judge, you sentence so-and-so to death. Lady so-and-so, you made some people. And everybody's been accused of a murder of some kind. And that's how the play began. And everyone's wondering what's happening. And one by one they get bumped off, one by one they get killed. And, you know, it, it's the tenderest Indian. Tenderest Indian went out to dine, one choked himself, and then one nine, nine. It's a little, little rhyme. And we were doing the matinee one afternoon, and I sort of put the record on backstage when I come back on. And silence. There's, there's no mute. There's no voice. And I look in the wings, and the stage manager's going, "Sadie." <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, now do I just walk into the wings and well, I'll, I'll see and I walk up and leave them on stage? And I thought, no, I can't. So I went, ladies and gentlemen, um, I was supposed to put a record on, but it hasn't worked. So it's not very good news. I heard it yesterday, and Lord So and So, you apparently sent somebody oh. to death. Detective Sergeant, you, you caused the book to be hanged. And I went all right around the, the cast. And then me and the wife, we don't get off because apparently we smuggled this old lady we were working with. So how can we plead guilty or guilty? And, or not guilty. Then the play carries on. The curtain came down here in the back one, and Neil Stacey playing the judge. He said, Well, Fraser, I've heard of building your part up. <laughs> <laughs> but he's had a swear word, well, but thank you. You are here. <laughs> so I'm here. And, and of course, big finish with Padders and, uh, and the rest of the gang. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> so, what do you think, guys? Have they been ha having an interesting life, right? <laughs> I gotta say, I love your shoes. They look very comfortable. <laughs> and yours. You, Richard. Yes. They are. They're very comfortable indeed, actually. Um, <clears throat> Fraser likes them as well. They're, oh, like, yes, they're yes. like dance. Yeah, they are. Well, I do look at dancing. Oh, okay. Have you seen them run across the stage? It's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> now, you... And I like your shoes as well. Oh, well, thank you. You know, I think I heard you introduce some people yesterday, and you said that you weren't interested in comedy. Well, dressed like that, I can't see how you... <laughs> <laughs> I said I'm not a comedian. I didn't say I wasn't funny looking. <laughs> <laughs> the joke is, you see. How tall are you when you're not wearing uh, shoes? Uh, about, uh, about four two. <laughs> no, I'm 5'4". I'm, I'm five, four. I'm five, four. Oh, that's not, not best things come in the smallest part. Yeah. So. It, it's, exactly. It's, it's an illusion. <laughs> uh, yeah, really. Yes. yes. Yeah, so does poison. That's true. <laughs> well, yeah. But I, every I moment I had, I cannot say. It's really sad. So, Wendy. Yes. May I call you Patters? Because it's really Who's cute. Oh, all right. <laughs> I get to call her Patters. How cute is that? <laughs> you, were, you were on the show for a year, is that right? And how, may I ask, you were very young when you first went on the show, is that right? 21. 21. I knew it was about 21, 22. And, and your character just seemed younger. Was she supposed to be like 15, is that right? Yeah. Okay. 15, 16, yeah. And, and they put her in that cat suit. 
<laughs> well, they did. <laughs> at, at 15, 16, and they can't do it. And you know, I, I kept, I, I was hoping you were older than 15 or 16. I'm glad to know that you were 22. That makes it a whole lot easier. <laughs> oh, and not the only one, and you know it. <laughs> but but what, the point is, is you had some very interesting costumes during that time. I did. Did they just go pick something up and go, let's make something out of this for her? Uh, no, no, no. The designer would do her sketches um, and I'd look at the sketches and then I'd readjust. Mm -hmm. uh, my main thing was comfort and although that cat suit actually is, uh, became quite popular, <laughs> uh, actually it was the most comfortable, easy to wear, easy to use costume that I had. Because I had some very short skirts, people may have noticed, yeah. <laughs> which, which were fine. Yeah. story coming up, a new costume, um, it was fairly, fairly you know, normal to, yeah. for the actor to say, well, uh, you know, that might not work or whatever. But she was great and so I've rarely made any changes. And actually I bought one of them, one of them I wanted to keep. And I asked the BBC if I could keep it and they said no, it's BBC. Yeah. And um, they then said the only way I could keep it is if I actually went shopping bought the material, which happened to be leather, with the, with the designer, and then the BBC made it, and then I kept it afterwards, uh -huh. um, which is exactly what I did, but it was a Cyberman story. I got um, silver paint all over it before I'd even taken it home. And I think I wore it once to, Fraser and I did a, some appearance somewhere in Selfridges or something, and I wore it once after. And then it sat and sat in the wardrobe, and in the end I thought, oh, I'm never going to wear this again. And then I gave it to Oxfam. Oh. Oh. If I'd known what I know now, <laughs> I might have hung on to it. Perhaps. <laughs> they came to me and said, right, like, Fraser, you, you worn the kilt now for 18 months. Do you want to now, you know, get rid of the kilt and stuff like that? And I said, no, I want to keep the kilt all the time. It was Patrick and his baggy stuff, and me, as we said, about right, the TARDIS. If I start wearing trousers, then I start wearing my own trousers, and it then just becomes Fraser with a Scottish accent. Right. But I was a bit worried once because we had a helicopter scene in Invention. <laughs> yeah. and, I remember. And the, <laughs> the BBC, no rehearsal, says, right, the helicopter comes in, the rope ladder comes down, you get up the rope ladder, you climb up, and then the doctor and the girl. And I thought, oh, helicopter downdraft killed me. <laughs> You would let the girl go first. James and James, you let the girl go first. Oh, good idea, Fraser. Yeah, let the girl go first. So the helicopter came in, no rehearsal, to, to, to rope ladder. Little Sally Falk was stood up and her little mini skirt was right out. And then, oh, break for lunch, Fraser, you're next. We're going to find out what Jamie wears under his kilt. And I'm sweating. And my dress was down by a riverbank fishing. I thought, you've got lead weights for fishing, haven't you? He said, yeah. I said, I've just read in today's woman's own, the Queen of England has lead weights sewn into the hem of her skirt. So on a windy day, you don't see the royal eye. Get those weights and put them in my kilt. Right, so we, we put all these lead weights in. I put the kilt back on. Right, lunch over, uh, get the helicopter, frame that so I clanked. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and the rope ladder came down, and I stood on the rope ladder. My kilt hung down like a safety curtain. <laughs> the cameraman was doing it, and he looked at it. He, he, he thought there was something wrong with his camera. And the water blood and ha ha. <laughs> and you still never found out what Jim Warren was. <laughs> Bravo. I had a, a, an incident with, uh, with Fraser actually in a ball pen. And um, <laughs> I was going to negotiate the purchase of Emmerdale Farm. Well, <laughs> Fraser, um, uh, who was one of the three um, brothers who owned. 
farm. Uh, the principal carriage has been in it for about 17 years, I think, when she yeah, was there. And, um, and he was actually supposed to be putting drops in a bull's eye. I was supposed to drive up in a 7 Series BMW in a beautiful city suit, which I managed to buy later for £100 from the BBC wardrobe department. <laughs> um, BBC and, will work for ITV then. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I can't remember what the story was now. Oh, yes, that's right. Um, <laughs> Anyway, oh, what was the story? It's fine. Oh, yeah, no, that's right, yes. Yeah. Anyway, we were, we, were, we were negotiating about this purchase of the farm in the middle of a straw barn as big as this room. And it wasn't just straw on the ground. It was a big bull that had had a big dinner before. <laughs> And um, anyway, I bought the suit, and people used to say to me afterwards, well, Richard, you do look smart in that suit. And I'd say, yes, it is. I, I bought it off Emmerdale Farm, and it's got bullshit all up the sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably true. Well, you, you talk a lot of bullshit, don't you? <laughs> now, that was the same... Right, I shall interrupt you next time. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, but that's, is at the same time that the, uh, the bull was supposed to lean on the rail? Uh, that is, indeed. Okay. So, yes. But I told that story, yes. Did anybody hear it? No, no. Yeah. 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 new audience. No, I'm going to tell you again. All right. Yeah. You should have been here last night. Yeah. All right, then. I can't remember what the story was now. <laughs> oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, yeah, it's about camera angles, right. actually. Yes. I know you're very keen to know about the technology of, of um, making television series. Um, anyway, during this scene, when I had to, um, uh, I, I had to be killed off, I don't know why. I didn't think they liked me very much. <laughs> but my character was going to be killed off. And I uh, went into the, into the bull pen, and the bull had been stamping its feet, and sort of smoke had been coming out of its mouth. And <laughs> literally true, this. And uh, anyway, after lunch, the bull was tranquilized, went in, everybody was very brave, and I was able to touch the bull and pet the bull and do all the things the director wanted me to do to the bull. And basically, <laughs> slide. <laughs> but, but, but you were there. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's what I mean. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, stroke the ball and things like that. And while, <laughs> and while I was. <laughs> And while I was doing all this, the bull was supposed to lean on me and squash me. And it was very undramatic. Um, I'll tell you the dramatic bit I'll like later. But anyway, while I was doing this, we were setting up the shot, the, the um, uh, camera boys were setting up their shot uh, behind the back end of the bull. And they were shooting through his legs. <laughs> and the... This is so difficult to say. <laughs> and, and anyway, the, the cameraman turned to me and he said, Richard, <laughs> this is the best two shot I've ever seen. <laughs> Fred has asked if I took the bull by the horn. <laughs> You didn't know this was coming, did you? No, no you didn't. No, I know. <laughs> I know, but I'm, I'm glad you guys are here. I didn't either. The bull didn't. I can tell you. <laughs> no, but uh, sometimes working on, especially on the farm, is very dangerous. But uh, you guys did a lot of works in, in quarries and, and those kind of things on the show, right? Uh, well, with, as my case, you were you were running and shooting and oh, jumping. Oh, very and brave. Very brave. <laughs> very brave indeed, yes. Well, we did have one uh, incident. Um, it was actually quite a, a, a famous stunt, and I cannot remember the name of the stunt man. Um, but it was in a quarry, and I had to drive a jeep and, uh, as fast as I could, and, there was, and stop on a mark at, on which there was a mini trampoline. And the stunt man had to run across and look as if he was being knocked over by the jeep. What happened was I would have to get to the 
trampoline at exactly the moment that the stunt boy got there, and he would be thrown into the air and roll down and down and down and down the quarry. And uh, yeah, that was actually, um, it's, it's quite alarming because, you know, I didn't want to ever shoot them up. Well, sure. <laughs> Especially you didn't want to hit him, I suppose. Well, that, well I didn't know. He's a nice guy. <laughs> If it had been Fraser, I would have done it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he interrupted me just then. <laughs> Derek Waring, because of Havoc. Derek, it was indeed, you know, Waring of Havoc. They were incredible, these, these guys. I mean, you know, they, they don't, they defy death. I remember one of them, there were, there were two very large stunt men, you remember them, called um, Dinny Powell. Yeah. Nosha Powell, yeah. yeah, and um, there was a scene in which um, uh, they had an accident, and I forget whether it was Dinny or Nosha, but he, they had, uh, he, he um, uh, had a collision oh, no. with um, one of the leading um, army vehicles, and it cut his leg right the way down. And uh, we had a bit of a break while he got stitched up in the hospital. He was there working in the afternoon. <laughs> oh, and, wow. Uh, <laughs> Very nice. Well, like, uh, did you ever feel like your life was in danger on the show? Only working with Fraser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, no, no. We, we we filmed in quarries. I remember doing a panel with Nicola Bryant once, and she was going, "Yeah." When we were filming in Spain, it says that I went, "What? Hold it right there." <laughs> <laughs> we went to Spain. We only ever got to go to. A <laughs> you did Spain though, didn't you? I, I did Spain, that was, that was great. But there was only one time when we were doing the war games, we were filming the Brighton rubbish dump. Oh, yeah, supposed yeah. to look like the trenches. And the three of us, and the director, Dave, uh, David Maloney, said, right, you, you, rush, you rush up here, Patrick's crazy, and um, there's a big explosion, <coughs> and um, Patrick said, well, how, how big is it exploded? Well, it, it's already set, it, it's set. So he said, no, no, how big, I want to see how big it exploded. <laughs> We, we can't, we've got to, he said, well, I tell you what, we'll get this, the, 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 the explosive expert to come along and, it, and calm you down, Patrick. So this guy came with fingers. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd done an explosion the week before, but with too much power, and boom. And so Patrick went, blow the charge. <laughs> they blew it, and this huge rock blew, was buried underneath. Landed right where Patrick would have been stood. Oh, oh so my God. that's when, that's one time I actually saw Patrick go, yeah, no, no, I, I'm not, I really refuse to do something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Explosive. I can do it, I can show you, sir. Whose name is Lucky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, now, uh, and you guys have been probably asked a lot about the, the pranks and such on the show and you know, uh, things that you tried to do. I mean, for instance, uh, like the holding of the hands when you were walking and that yeah, thing. Yes, yeah, uh, in the Tomb two of the yeah. Right, right, and, and you guys have seen them hold the hands, right? Yeah. Show. Yes. yes, and you had to hold way up here, and why was that? Why? Because there was a camera angle or something, is that right? So, it, it's, you were holding the hands way up here instead of... Yes, that's right, because we had this gag about grabbing each other's hands rather than we're supposed to take um, Debbie's hands, and we could Debbie, to, oh, Victoria, don't worry. And we had this gag of let's take each other's hands, but uh, Morris Barry, the director, was not uh, known for his sense of humour, and we knew he wouldn't let us do it, so we had to do it on the take. And we couldn't say to the cameraman, how far are you cutting, because it would give the game away. So. If we'd done it like that and uh, cut the weight, well, there was no gag, so that's why we actually held our hands, knowing it being shot. Come on, Victoria. <laughs> so that's why we had, it was slightly too high, but we had to. Uh, yeah, I thought it was a great bit, and uh, that's why I asked about it. Doing those kind of things at that time was, was easier to get in scene because you only had two or three edits, is that right? That's right, yes, that's right, yeah. What was, uh, what was the number? Because I, I heard uh, we once had seven, is that right? Um, well, yes. Um, <clears throat> if you had more than two, two was acceptable, three was not acceptable, and John was trying to speak um, Chinese, and he had seven, and you could have cut the atmosphere with a knife, you really could. But I mean, the, the point was, we didn't have the budget uh, it, when we were. Uh, or well, it was not only budget, it was time. Well, well yes, but time is money. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because it was, 
because it was only an hour. Was it the same for you then? Absolutely. An hour and a half recording? Yeah, absolutely. And if you didn't finish the show in that hour and a half. So I think once we did a scene from the show before yes. the following week because they, the technicians would not work over past the time. They would, they really would pull the plug. Um, so you had to get it in. I think the budget was two thousand pounds. Amazingly, was it? Yeah, and, and and they had to fit all the all the technical stuff in at the end. And actually, everybody was looking forward to the technical stuff. And the actors, you know, just say, "I have to get on with it, do it." Yeah, that's absolutely right. You, you, they'd stop so that they could set up something technical, but they wouldn't stop for an actor. Because I remember in Mind Robber when I threw Christopher Robb over my shot, you know, when I throw him, mm -hmm. uh, and he's six foot whatever he was, seven or something, I, I felt that it didn't look very good, and they would, and I asked if I could do it again, and they absolutely refused. Mm -hmm. So I was always disappointed about that. There was a, a technical thing that I wanted to talk about last night, that we the film was breaking up. Uh, I was explaining how the ice warriors actually killed somebody. Um, the guy, they, they convulsed like that. What happened was there was a, a, a rubber mirror, a shiny mirror, it was made of rubber, and the actor would go up, hit his mark, the camera though wouldn't shoot the actor, it would shoot this mirror, and then a prop man at the back would pull this big rubber mirror. So it looks like you were getting killed like that by, by the ice warrior. And in one particular state, the actor scared. The actor rushed up, hit his mark, and the prop man went, and the handle came off. <laughs> so the actor stood there like that, and the ice warrior went, shit, missed the button. <laughs> <laughs> He's laughing, look. <laughs> Hey, if your kids get these jokes, any reason. He's explaining to his dad. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, monsters, rubber suits, those kind of things. Budgets, of course, got in the way of everything. But I was looking at pictures of some of the, uh, uh, of you two, in fact, and there were, I forget which monsters they were, the monster of the week, whichever they were. But you were trying to look scared, and clearly you weren't. <laughs> and it wasn't just bad acting. No. <laughs> no. no. We never had incidents like that on. Oh, oh no, <laughs> for me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I, well, I, sometimes, and, and, and of course, acting is acting, and you, you, whether it's on a ball hanging off a stick like they do now, or or whatever. Um, but but sometimes when the representation is there, did you ever find it difficult to interact with that representation that, because it was so silly looking, the alien or something like that? Can I take that one? Because um, we we did a we did um, uh, one of the uh, one of the, the shows we did was with Globby Axons. You can probably remember which mm -hmm. the name of the show was. And when we came into the studio, the actual the set was wonderful. Um, as far as I remember, it was something pretty clinical. And uh, the walls were white, and um, they were actually made of polystyrene. And um, suddenly, I didn't realize what was going to happen. This great fist, great hairy fist, came through the wall, and it was it, w it was a globby axon breaking in, and it was really quite scary. I mean, I was genuinely scared, <laughs> and, and, which is lucky because I can't act either. <laughs> but okay, another thing. Sorry. No, no. Go on. No, no. I was just going to say the oh, same thing. Uh, Funnily enough. Ice Warriors, yeah. even yeah. though I sat and watched them for three hours having all that latex put on and everything, I found Ice Warriors really creepy oh, yeah. once you got onto the set. We had, um, in the Green Death, uh, we had maggots, you may remember. <laughs> and uh, in the um, studio, which was quite clever, they had these huge drums. And at the centre of the drum, was a picture of the Welsh scenery. And in front of the drum, we had the maggots, real maggots, creeping around. Oh. And what nobody had uh, taken into account was that under the very hot studio lighting, oh. the maggots would become blue bottles. Oh. And they were absolutely horrible, and they were flying around the studio. And, uh, it was quite disgusting. Oh. <laughs> So that's a whole other Doctor Who episode right there. <laughs> <laughs> the invasion of the blue bottle. <laughs> we, we acted through it all. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No one gave us a medal afterwards. We should have had it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and how, how about yourself, Frederick? With with the with the uh, with costumes and such, the aliens. Uh, what what was was there anything that just come across as silly? I was looking forward to working with the Daleks. I, I couldn't wait to work with the Daleks. And uh, there's a. a an unwritten rule that you do not touch the props in any way in case you break them. And one day we broke for lunch, and I went up to the studio and I went to the Starlet and I opened the lid and I got in it and I pulled it and I was going, I'm a Dalek, I'm a Dalek. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then suddenly these, I heard footsteps, oh, it could be the director. Two actors came and they leant on me, because <laughs> you can't see inside the dark, they leant on me and they said, this director couldn't direct Pick to be Dirty. Then. The script is awful, the acting is crazy. And after about two minutes, I went, I heard that, I heard that right away. And they all went, oh, who's the one? And it's like leaning on his TARDIS and somebody walks away. I got free beer for the rest of the week. That's wonderful. Well, you know, uh, we, can, we can take some questions from the audience. I think we have some time. Yes, it is. Right over there, look. Right over there. Right over yeah, there. Yeah. Why don't you come up over here so we can actually uh, hear you? Testing. Testing, testing. One, two. Here you go. Hi. What's your name? Um, I'm Simon. Well, hello, Simon. What do you have? Um, well, I would actually like to ask, um, uh, Frazier and, uh, uh, What's your That's Wendy. Richard, Wendy, Frazier. This is Simon. Okay, everyone. Uh, uh, just one quick question. Uh, who's your favorite doctor? Oh. 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 Wow. <laughs> well, clearly, although biased, obviously, <laughs> it's got to be Patrick. Yeah, right. Yeah. Doctor number two. Definitely, Patrick. Brigadier, yeah. why are you clapping? <laughs> <laughs> you lit. <laughs> but my second favourite is Peter Capaldi. I, I was, when I was doing that play, I went to Cardiff. I said, oh, Peter wants to meet you. you think, yeah, of course he does, of course he does. I went on the set, and it was just him that day, and there was a Peter. And I oh, he said, Fraser, Fraser, how are you? He said, listen, I'm, I'm going to do this scene, but, but don't go away. I thought, well, that's it. I won't see him anymore. He'll, he'll go off and he'll say, but, 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 stay there. I want a picture of you and me on my mobile phone cam. So, so don't go away. And he said, oh, you've got a, you're wearing a white robot. And I said, a white robot on my jacket. I said, yes, it is. He went to this scene and he came back. He, we had pictures, pictures. He had one more scene to do. And he did this scene and it was a tiny room and the producer was there, the director, all the cast, the crew, and they would cut. That's fine, we'll break for lunch. He went, before we break, he said, this guy here, if it wasn't for him and his doctor, we wouldn't be here now working today. And they all gave me a round of applause. I thought, how lovely of Peter Capaldi to do that. Because sometimes people take over a show, it's their show now, never mind the past. But Peter Capaldi, I thought, oh, and I got a lump in my throat when he said that. He's a lovely, lovely yeah. man. And actually, it's quite true, because if Patrick hadn't been so brilliant, Mm -hmm. uh, Doctor Who would not have continued, yeah. um, he, he being the first regeneration. Absolutely. Um, he had to be good, and he, he was, I thought it was amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with all that, and um, actually, recently... Um, it's okay to back up, you can interact with TV here. Uh, recently, um, the, uh, both Emmerdale Farm and Doctor Who have been celebrating 40 years or something, yeah. but... Uh, to be quite honest, they've forgotten the classic series of, of both Amadeo Farm and Doctor Who. And uh, the invitations have only gone out to the, to the new stars, but not the old ones. Aww. And unfortunately, uh, it's a sad thing to see because, well, we love having you here. And, uh, yes, don't we? You, uh, you, you had once said that you, you would kill for one line with Peter Capaldi, is that right? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I was just curious what that one line would be. Well, I, oh, I don't know. I okay. couldn't possibly say. No, uh, no I would. Uh, in fact, I, you know, to be just in do one little bit of Doctor Who, mm -hmm. again, would be like a dream come true, really. Yeah, well, we would support that. Sure. Yeah. 
Can I just reinforce what Fraser has just said about Peter and Wendy as well? A um, lovely man. Um, he had his first outing, having become um, uh, the doctor, uh, was in a, a small convention, a charity thing that we did in Windsor. And I was, well, not nervous, but I was really looking forward to meeting Peter because he's a tremendously good actor. And I think he was an absolutely wonderful looking doctor myself. Yes. And um, I was, you know, it was slightly apprehensive of meeting him and so on. And he rushed up to me and he said, Richard, I've been lying to meet you. I've been one of your fans since I was 16. <laughs> It made me feel a bit uh, antique. <laughs> he was a hundred. We are a hundred. I, I keep, you know, I gotta tell you one thing that I appreciate about Peter Capaldi is finally having a doctor that's older than me in this new series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, this is, uh, let's see, oh, you have a question? Come on up here. Okay, project. <laughs> All right. Uh, was there a moment when you were first starting out the series for each of you? where you either first encountered fans or you realized, hmm, this show is going to do something to my life here. <laughs> or any moment that seemed, oh, there are now Doctor Who people coming up and approaching me. <laughs> was there ever a moment like that? I, I remember once I was coming, I lived in Chiswick at the time, and I was walking about nine, ten o'clock at night, and this bloke came towards me, you know, really with a broken nose. And, and I, I tried to walk past him and he went, hey, just a minute. You're that uh, Scotch bloke on Doctor Who. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're, you're the young hero, aren't you? Oh, here he comes and punches the face. <laughs> <laughs> what happens next week? Because I'll be on night duty. I'll miss it. <laughs> Did you tell him? Did you tell him? I, I told him. Oh, yeah, I told him. I was in um, York once, and um, I wanted to go to the loo. <laughs> oh, nice stretch. And I was walking down this narrow passage in a hotel in York, and there were two women walking towards me, talking. And the two women took up the whole width of the passage. And as I got there, I thought one of them would move to the side. But she did, they blocked my way. And one looked at the other one, and she said, He's not nearly as good looking in real life, is he? I didn't really think, I mean, yes, you were recognized from time to time, but there wasn't a feel of this is going to go on forever and in 40 odd years I am going to be sitting somewhere talking about it. There wasn't a, there wasn't a sense of that right. at that period in time, no. You know, the, uh, there's something, I don't know if it's just in the British water or something, but uh, yeah, I think the Rolling Stones and Doctor Who, and just these things just keep going on and on forever. It's, uh, it's crazy. I think if you get the TARDIS, there's something that doesn't age you once you meet the TARDIS. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah Sutton, you know, Janet Fielding. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, Nicola, uh, Nick yeah. O'Brien. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I saw her last, we saw her last uh, year here. Yes, yes. Yeah, she looked to, what, 12? It's kind of weird. Colin <laughs> <laughs> Baker's the exception to the rule, I think. <laughs> Said, but then again, I'm the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. All right, we have a question. I come on up here, too. Uh, this is actually a question for Wendy, working with Patrick and Fraser. Uh, do you have a absolutely this is my favorite moment ever story? And you can't say the one where he Fraser had chicken pox and wasn't on set. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Other than the time they had to film around you. Yeah. No, there was no, there was no special. I mean, that was an incredibly special period of my life. The the job itself, the work, and working with Patrick, who I adored and was a fan of, from his from his earlier work when I was a child, watching all the Dickens classics on a Sunday afternoon that Pat was always in, and, um, and working with Fraser. It was daunting to start with. You know, I had to take over from Debbie, um, from a strong Victorian girl character, and try and make something of 
Zoe, who was so completely different. But, but no, it was a, the whole thing, the whole period of time that I was there was the most special, actually, <laughs> of, of any job I've ever done. It wasn't really like a job, was it? No. no. It, it, we had too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, did, we were serious and did our jobs as well as we could, but we still managed to have a lot of fun. <laughs> But you, when you joined, I mean, you had a lot of the dialogue, like the, oh, the distillation of the calculus, and you eat into the, oh, oh. Well, I couldn't even spell astrophysicist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, same with the uh, John Pertwee era, but then, um, who was your producer, actually? Peter Bryant. Peter Bryant at that time, uh, when I first that joined. Before was um, Ellis Lloyd, as well, before. Oh, yeah. Ellis Lloyd. But, uh, I was going to say, but... Still applies that the actual um, setup of, of uh, those days and what is called the classic series, we had Barry Lertz. Uh, the producers were all very good and uh, they selected people who were going to get on together and have a bit of fun. And I think actually it's, it's quite a, an important thing. The most important, the most serious parts that I've ever played, I've always found that it's much best to try and find the funny side of them. Um, because otherwise it becomes very heavy, actually. And uh, the reverse is also true. If you're doing comedy, you need to find the most serious aspects of the comedy. Otherwise the, the, the character isn't funny, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what other questions do we have? Uh, let's see... You with the fuzzy arms. <laughs> oh, you have a whole suit to go with it. Give oh. <laughs> some paws. <laughs> very good. Here we are. Alright, um, I haven't actually been watching the show for very long. I just started last night. But... <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. You still have the new who smell on you. That's the, worst the Jamie, that's the worst Jamie costume I've ever seen. <laughs> He was 19, and his name was Charles Tyrone Smith. Aww. And the reason why he was called Charles Tyrone Smith was because um, when I got him, a friend of mine said he'd always wanted to have a cat called Tyrone. <laughs> so the cat was called Tyrone. Right. Uh, but then I wrote a play about oh. homelessness, which won an award in Edinburgh, and it was called The Cage. And it was about this homeless person sitting in a box. Um, homeless and hungry, and his name was Charlie. And when I rewrote the play for Edinburgh, I wanted it to begin with a sort of traditional court scene where you hear, "Call Mr. Smith, call Mr. Smith, call Mr. Smith," and um, he, the, the the character was called um, Charlie. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, okay, better be Charlie Smith. <laughs> but that didn't sound right either. Now this is a true story, and uh, you've got to believe this. My cat was sitting beside me. I needed three names for the cat. And I thought, Charles Smith, Charles Smith, that's not very good. And this is true. The cat nudged me, and he said, Tyrone. <laughs> Charles Tyrone Smith. <laughs> With me, it's horses. I, I, I breed horses. And a couple of years back, I, I had my horse box and I drove my mare 200 miles to Newmarket Stud and led her out. And I just thought, I, I said to the stud group, I've come 200 miles today. Now, what happens if human beings, if they don't fancy having a bit of fun, because, oh, darling, I've got a headache. Oh, I feel ill. You know. 
A horse can't tell you that. You can yeah. lead the stallion out and he cannot feel like, you know, covering a mare. And he said, Fraser, I've got this little powder. If he comes out, I get this powder and I put it into his breakfast. I'm all shut up. He eats it. Within five minutes, he's snorting a rare <laughs> 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 I don't know what it's called, but it tastes awful. <laughs> 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 and it's only Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> it's not even quite 11 o'clock yet, is it? I'll be selling it at my table when I'm signing all it up. Do you any of you back horses? Yeah. Horses? Horses. Or I'll watch races, you yes. watch horse racing. Yes. If you see in your American uh, press that Jamie Crimmond is running, don't think it's Fraser. <laughs> this is latest horse. Name the latest horse Jamie McCrimmon, and Richard's got a, a tail of it, haven't you? A, a one of two pairs. So <laughs> one, one, two, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I did, have, I did have one leg of one of Fraser's horses. There were four of us in it. It won so many times, Glenugi, yeah, right. that it didn't cost us a penny. No, it didn't cost a penny. Oh, wow. And that is amazing for that someone is. who's only got, at that point, two yeah. horses. <laughs> he won 16 races. I named him after a whiskey called Glenugi. Um, and I used to send, you know, friends and I named him after Glenugi. He won yesterday, and I'd send the, the newspaper cuttings to this distillery up in Glasgow, up in Aberdeen. And they never sent me one bottle of Glenugi. <laughs> Not. Wow. Well, thank you for spending this hour with us. Have you guys enjoyed this hour? Yeah. If you're coming to the charity auction, I'm auctioning this jacket off later on this evening for the charity. So um, he wants to have a bit of my jacket. Yes, well, indeed. If he's got like, a moth in the bag. Uh, if you'd like to take home a, a bit of Fraser, you can come to charity auction and do that. In fact, uh, charity is for Habitat for Our Humanity. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, guest auctioneers. Uh, are we going to be auctioning? He'll be auctioning off the jacket himself. So feel free to join us. We're going to make some great money. Last year we did 5K. We can do better than that this year. I know we can. Uh, let's give our uh, panelists an amazing round of applause. We've got new who coming up next. I I love the fact that we have so many fans for so many okay. shows, and the fact that uh, we have spanned generations upon generations. And thank you all for being here with us. Uh, get some water. Take a quick break. We have about five minutes.